Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. If you are here, it probably means that you love Dungeons & Dragons or any other tabletop RPGs like I do. It's always great fun, and a good way to pass some time with friends. Though, I'm sure we all experience that one friend who is just a bit too much to handle at times. Much like the subject of this next D&D horror story. But first, a video of cats to farm them likes and subscriptions. Wasn't that cute? I would say that that was cute enough for a like. So do that. With that out of the way, strap in and grab a snack, as this story is a bit of a long one. So let's jump right in. Greg, the player who wants his characters to die, over and over, by Reddit user Flimmer Fox. So, this story happened many years ago. D&D 4.0 just released, but most pen and paper groups in our region decide to stick to 3.5. A friend of mine started a new homebrew adventure, starting at level 3. We were only two players in the DM, and two other players wanted to join later. I decided to create a half-elf warrior wizard. The other player, let's call him Greg, created a minotaur. Later the DM told me that Greg refused to play as anything else. Luckily, the DM had some rules up his sleeve to convert a minotaur to level 3. So each of us started as a participant in some sort of battle tournament. Not very original, but it was fun. We fought to the top ranks, and finally our characters faced each other in the finale. It was a one-sided fight. My character had an absurdly high AC because of the shield spell and some feats, so he won. As finalists, we were rewarded with some magic items. The Crown Prince also ordered us, as the New Hope of the Kingdom, to collect some MacGuffin, Power Stones. It was the main quest of the campaign. Two Power Stones were on islands and two on the mainland of the kingdom. Greg, as the Minotaur, shouted, he is a weakling. He can only win when he's cheating with his magic. I don't fight alongside weaklings. It was at this point that I realized that Greg was very angry. I think because his character didn't win the tournament. So my character tried to smooth things over and challenged the Minotaur to a fight without magic to prove that he was honorable and brave. Greg and his Minotaur agreed. So our characters fight again, this time without magic. The duel was very close. The Minotaur managed to win, but he only had a few HP left. See, he is a weakling, the Minotaur brags. Then Greg announced, quote, My Minotaur is beheading the weakling, and then trampling on his lifeless body. The DM interrupts him and told him that my character actually was alive, and the tournament clerics were just healing him. Greg clearly didn't like that. Quote, I don't care, he has no honor so I will do the quest on my own. Let's save a little time here. It took the DM over an hour to tell Greg that D&D is a cooperative game, and that he won't allow him to exclude another player. So finally, our characters were about to start their quest. My character wanted to start where we were advised to start, on an island full of kobolds, but the Minotaur refused. Greg wanted to get the Power Stone in the Troll Hills first. The NPC told us that this was one of the most dangerous power stones to get, since there were a lot of nasty trolls guarding it. And then Greg says, quote, Trolls are no match for a minotaur. After several warnings by the NPCs, and an out-of-character warning by the DM, Greg did not change his mind. My character resigned, and I felt a bit unsettled because of Greg's behavior. So our characters traveled to the troll hills. On our way, we got many warnings of the trolls. Many guards told us how strong and dangerous these trolls were, etc. A few days later, we finally get to see some of them. The DM tries his best to describe them as terrifyingly as possible. There were five of them, and they were eating an ox that they had torn apart with their bare hands. My character made one last attempt to hold back the Minotaur, but Greg's only reaction was, quote, I charge them and strike them down. I was unsure if my character should help the Minotaur, but this didn't last long. The Minotaur was slain in the very first round, so our first session ended with Greg's first dead character. The second session was very short. 
Greg created a new character. It was a human halberdier. Our characters met at a small village. My character needed help for the quest, and Greg's character agreed. On our way back to the capital, we wanted to make some money, so we escorted some merchants. On our way, we were attacked by two trolls and some goblins. The NPC guards, who were described by the DM as experienced warriors, wanted to take care of the trolls while we were defending the merchants from the goblins. Greg won the initiative. I suggested a plan to shield the civilians from the goblin and use attacks of opportunity if the goblins would ignore us. Guess what Greg did? He shouted, quote, Get out of my way! I will handle the trolls by myself! So, he ran. Yes, he ran. If you're not familiar with D&D, if you run, you can't do anything else your turn. So he ran directly in front of the trolls and ended his turn. I was crying internally. The DM asked, quote, Are you sure? These are the same monsters your first character died to. And Greg just said, yeah. So the trolls killed his second character. And Greg got mad, really mad, at the DM. The DM tried to explain the situation to Greg again, but Greg felt he should have defeated the trolls, and the DM was just being unfair. Not before long, they started yelling at each other about who was to blame for the death of his character. And after about a half an hour, I left. So, the second session ended. You may wonder if this was the end of Greg's quest to kill his own characters, but let me tell you, this is just the beginning. Maybe I'll tell you more another time or post. TLDR, player ignores DM's warnings, gets his characters killed, and blames the DM for everything. Well, it certainly sounds like Greg is definitely a uh, that guy and also suffers from main character syndrome to the point where he thought his characters were invincible. Rushing into a group of trolls without even being able to attack due to combat rules. Honestly, what did he expect was going to happen? Unlucky for OP, but lucky for us. Greg did rear his head again. So, let's get right into it. Greg is back, and don't you dare say his name. It was our third session. A new player, Jesse, joined. He played a human cleric. Greg's newest character was a half-orc barbarian, and I was still playing my half-elf, warrior wizard. The DM clearly wanted to make some progress this time. He briefly summarized that the two new characters were sent by the prince, and our characters were on a ship to get to Goblin Island. He asked us to describe each other, and after we finished, he continued with, quote, in the distance, you see a lush green island of Obador. You can spot a settlement on the island. There is. And he was cut off by Greg saying, quote, My character jumps into the water and swims to the settlement. The DM stops him and says, quote, What? No, I'm just describing the island. Your ship is heading to the settlement anyways. Just let me finish the description real quick. The DM tried to continue, but was yet again interrupted by Greg with, quote, no, my character can't wait on a ship. He swims to the settlement. Swimming is way faster than sailing anyways. You should know that Greg was an athlete swimmer and worked as a lifeguard. We were unsure about his claim, but the DM ruled, quote, Okay, make a swim check. If you get a good result, I will allow you to arrive earlier. And Greg responds, What? No, I don't have the swim skill. I didn't know we needed that. So, Greg's result was something abysmally bad. I can't remember exactly. Everyone had a good laugh. Everyone except Greg. And the DM ruled that the half-orc arrived an hour later and a bit exhausted. Greg didn't like that. He tried to argue with the DM, but his arguments fall short. Our group met up again, and Greg needed to vent his anger. So, he tried to bully Jesse. Quote, Get out of my way, priest. Step to the side so I can pass. Our characters were standing on an empty road, with more than enough space to pass by, and we were about to head in the same direction anyways. Nonetheless, his half-orc ordered the cleric to step to the side. Cleric refused, so Greg asked the DM to roll for intimidation. Initially, the DM did not allow that, but after a half an hour of arguing, the DM gave in. Jesse asked if he could roll for intimidation too, and of course he was allowed to do so. They both made their checks. 
Greg's result was too low, and Jesse's result was on the other hand a natural 20. So DM ruled, quote, Greg, your half-orc is intimidated by the cleric. Greg's reaction? Quote, My character grabs the cleric, lifts them in the air, shakes them, and throws them out of the way. Uh, your character is intimidated. Don't forget that, the DM replied. And Greg said, quote, Yeah, I know. My character always does that if he's intimidated by someone. The DM sighed and clearly didn't feel like arguing with Greg anymore. He suddenly turned the adventure into a fixed railroad, just ignored any arguing, and described us walking to the mayor. A guard guided us to the kobold dungeon outside of the town, and the DM simply let us roll initiative for the first encounter in front of the entrance. He only gave us as much freedom as absolutely necessary. It worked. We fought through the dungeon and got the first power stone. And for the very first time, I thought, hey, this adventure is not going to turn into a dumpster fire. This was until our characters were on their way back to the settlement. I wanted to do just one sentence of roleplay. I described my character taking off his hat to wipe his forehead. Your character has a hat? Greg asked. I had described the hat multiple times at this point, but I did again. Why not? It was a red musketeer hat with a big white feather. Huh, that's silly. Is your character a girl? Then Greg announces, quote, My character grabs the hat and tears it into pieces. The DM was about to intervene, but I refused. I wanted to play it cool. So I let him do that, just to take my spare hat out of my backpack and put it on. But Greg, being Greg, shouted, quote, I want to grab that too. This time, the DM intervened. The NPC guide drew his rapier and threatened the half-orc. But Greg did not care. The DM demanded a combat maneuver roll, and Greg succeeded. So, my spare hat was shredded too. But in exchange, the NPC swung the rapier elegantly and cut a strand of hair from the half-orc. Greg was livid. He declares to attack the NPC. DM initially did not allow that. Chaos broke out at the gaming table. And finally, Greg even yelled at the DM. So, DM gave in and let us fight. Everybody against Greg. It was a short fight, and the half-orc was knocked down. We took away his weapons and healed him. We wanted to continue our way to the settlement, as Greg was constantly complaining about the removal of his weapons and promised not to attack again. So, we gave him back his weapons. Guess what he immediately was about to do? Yes, you're correct. The half-orc immediately attacked us again. We knocked the half-orc down. Again. But this time, he died. Accidentally, I swear. Greg asked us why we always killed his beloved characters. Tears stood in his eyes. We tried to explain it to him, but he didn't get it. So we ended Session 3. Session 4. So, the last player joined our group. It was Carl. Greg and Carl came a bit earlier that day and rolled up their characters. They played as two brothers, human fighters. When I arrived at the gaming table, everybody seemed to be in a good mood. So I was looking forward to the session. Story-wise, Cleric and my character left the Kobold Island, and our group met at Port City. We introduced ourselves and asked Greg's character for his name. He didn't reply. We thought he might have missed our question. So, later, my character asked Carl's character in-game while they were alone in the tavern for a his and his brother's name. So, our group bought some stuff, talked to NPCs, and we were about to leave the city to head to the next dungeon. Only, Greg's character was missing, because he wanted his character to do some muscle training alone. My character walked over to the training yards and asked, I don't know his character's name anymore, let's go with Ragnar. Quote, Hey Ragnar, are you finished? We want to leave the city. That's when Greg announced, Quote, Charge! You can't just attack random people, said the DM confused. But he said my name, Greg responded. Okay, but your character is lawful good, and that's not a reason at all, the DM responded. At that point, Greg told us his definition of the alignment, lawful good. He repeated that definition time and time again, and I believe he was, maybe still is, dead serious about it. He said, quote, Lawful only means that you have a moral codex. Nobody needs to understand or even know your moral codex, even the DM. And if you are always true to that codex, that means you are good. And it just so happened, 
that killing anybody who dared to say his name was part of that code. The DM fell dead silent at that point. He said nothing more but goodbye that day, when he later left the gaming table, and our characters began fighting. My character managed to knock his out, and I took the chance to kill Ragnar. Why did you kill Ragnar? Greg asked. I responded with, quote, Because it's part of my moral codex to kill anybody who wants to attack me. He responded with, But you did not do that last session. And I answered, Yes, that's why my character is only lawful neutral. So, the session ended early. A few days later, the DM told us that he was burned out and didn't want to play D&D for a while. So our campaign came to an end. TLDR, player lets DM kill him over and over until DM lost interest in D&D. You would think that after his characters keep dying, with the last one being done by the party, that Greg would figure out that maybe he should change the way he was playing. Unfortunately, he seems to lack any self-awareness whatsoever, and makes me wonder why the rest of the players would still put up with his crap. And why, oh why, would OP next play in a game with Greg as the DM? Let's find out. A Tale of Greg, the DM, and a Two Miles Gold Dragon Our DM was gone. Carl suggested Greg as our next DM, and we all agreed. And so Greg started a homebrew campaign, starting from level 1. Carl played an elven ranger, Jesse played a halfling bard, and I played a human wizard warrior. If you read the other stories of Greg, you might not believe it, but the first two sessions were kind of decent. Greg was really happy to DM. We had to defend a dwarven settlement against some evil orcs. There was only one odd thing. We were rewarded with 10,000 platinum coins on level 2. For all of you non-D&D players, a truckload of too much money. And because Greg was a huge dwarven fanboy, the dwarves sold us magic stuff for only a few coins. I got a magic Zweihander, named Frostmorn, plus 3 with 66 frost damage for 5 platinum. So our plan was to buy us a nice mansion next session. We knew it was too much money, and we talked about it with Greg. But he said the dwarves are just that rich in Faerun. Since it wasn't that big of a deal, as long as the campaign was fun, we did not complain. Session 3 started with a two miles long gold dragon flying above us in the sky. We didn't know what to do with this information, so our characters just moved on. Greg was somehow upset because we missed a big plot point. We asked him later what that meant, but he assumed we were just not smart enough to understand. So, because he was upset, I guess, a bunch of bandits showed up and demanded our money. They somehow knew about it. We wanted to fight, but that's when we found out that these bandits could run, attack, steal money, and run in one activation. I was lucky to be able to charge one of them, and I hit him with a natural 20. When I was about to roll the damage, Greg announced, quote, Oh, your notes are wrong. Frostmourne is just a Zweinhander plus one. One d4 frost damage. With that major debuff, I wasn't able to knock out the bandit, so they ran away, with our money. We followed their tracks, because we didn't know what to do, to an old tower in the middle of a forest. Inside the tower, we encountered numerous riddles. Unfortunately, we weren't able to solve even one riddle. That's when Greg announced, quote, Oh, your notes are wrong. Frostmourne is a sentient Zweihander, and can speak to you. So, hooray. We spent the next hours watching Frostmourne solving riddles that we did not understand, even after Frostmourne solved them in front of our characters. Let me give you an example. We were transported into a cubic room. All of the walls were made out of indestructible mirrors that could change the lighting color of the room if you touched them. There were no clues, no doors, no windows, only an indestructible flying crystal in the middle of the room. Do you get it? Come on. And do you get it? Easy, just punch the indestructible crystal again and again with Frostmourne, because something indestructible sometimes is not indestructible if you punch it 20 times. Feel free to use that genius riddle for your own D&D groups. The final room was a huge hall, 300 feet by 300 feet. Ceiling height was, I don't know, 50 feet or something. Amazing. And there he was, the two mile long dragon sitting in this room. Can you imagine? 
because to this day, I can't. Can somebody draw a picture for me? Greg told us that according to his calculations, the dragon had a lot of space inside of that room. But much to the disappointment of Greg, we just asked the dragon if he saw the bandits. It was at this point that we found out that Greg forgot about the bandits. He made up a story that they used the portal inside the tower. So we followed them and left the dragon. Session 4 was rather boring. We killed a bunch of ogres that were the henchmen of the bandits, and Greg announced, quote, Oh, your notes are wrong. Frostmord is a Zionhander plus one, with 4d6 frost damage. Session 5 was the final session of Greg's campaign. We found out that the bandits were actually the royal family of a secret kingdom. We could only get to the kingdom via two entrances guarded by bullies. Um, I mean guards. Everyone who wanted to enter had to pay a toll of 1,000 gold or must win in a duel. So, our ranger chose the duel. That's when we found out that duel meant all guards against one character. So, we paid the money, and because we attacked them, we had to give them all our money. Yes, the toll was all of your money. Nice. But we still had our equipment, you say? That's when we found out that there were bandits everywhere in this kingdom, and they were just as overpowered as the bandits from Session 3. They stole everything. Okay, not everything. They left us with our underwear. Very gracious. Just when the bandits wanted to leave us, a bunch of paladins, followers of Faerun God Tyr, showed up. They caught the bandits in no time, and we were happy for the first time that day. But there was one problem. How should they know who of us was telling the truth? I had an idea. I told them that the bandits had stolen my wizard book, with my name and my raven familiar. Raven familiar could speak common in D&D 3.5. I thought that because they had these items now, it could prove our words. But no. Greg said, quote, There is only one truth, the paladins declared, and only one way to find out the truth. The one who can balance the longest on a ten-foot pole always speaks the truth. I kid you not. Greg told us that the logic was that people who are physically fit are hard workers, and hard workers are always honest people. So, we had to do that. Luckily, the ranger had some good dice rolls, and so we got our stuff back, and also the equipment of the bandits who were executed by the paladins for being evil. At that point, we players were in a YOLO mode. We couldn't take anything serious anymore, but we still continued playing. Our characters arrived at the next town. Greg told us that in this town, there was a temple for every deity of Faerun. We asked him if we could also find temples of the evil gods, like Velsharun the god of undead, or Baal, the god of violence and murder. Greg nodded. We visited those temples and asked the priests and followers why they were not doing evil things. They told us that they had no reason to do evil things. So we suggested, quote, Why not just, you know, if you are followers of the god of murder, you know, uh, do murder stuff. And that did the trick. Hundreds of followers of evil deities just stormed out of the temples and killed everyone. It didn't take long, and there was a big, bloody holy war going on in the streets of that town. Suddenly, the two miles gold dragon appeared in the sky. He used his fire breath to kill hundreds of people in the streets, and landed just before our characters. With his thundering deep voice, he asked us to give him one reason that he should not kill us. We were just confused. I can remember that at that point, my character challenged the dragon to the 10-foot pole test, but the dragon just killed us with his fire breath. And that was the end of Greg's campaign. He told us that the bandits, slash royal family, were good guys all along, but we never even considered that. How rude. A few weeks later, I saw Greg at his train station. We talked a bit. I said that I was just creating a new character for another group. That's when he told me that my character did not die. He announced, quote, Your notes must have been wrong. Frostmourne's wielder is immune to elemental damage. Well, that was quite the journey. From being such a nightmare player, why would anyone suggest that Greg DM a campaign? I mean, how are they expecting it to go? Though, I do kind of find it funny that Greb kept changing the stats of OP's sword. Hopefully, 
OP has since found a game where none of this tomfoolery is taking place. Have you ever run into a player or DM like Greg? If so, feel free to share your story in the comments. If you have a nightmare story of your own and would like it to be read in a video, you can post it in the comments, on the channel subreddit, or even DM me on Twitter. As always, I appreciate all of you and hope all of your roles are natural 20s. Until next time.